This is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and it is time for The Rant with Barbara Rose Brewer. Now, some of you have written in, Barbara, I haven't shared this with you yet, but people have written in saying, what happened to The Rant? We haven't seen Barbara in weeks. Well, let me tell you, when you don't see Barbara, you know she's busy working on something always working on something so when we say that ageism is something that needs to be changed we definitely mean it because if barbara rose brooker is out there and doing what she loves to do we all can live our best life in fact we can live as she says magnificently so barbara welcome back to uh new cleveland radio we took a couple weeks hiatus and uh, can you give us a little hint? What yes, you thank you. Well, I have a new I have a new book that's coming out next year. So I've been working with my editor. It's simple as that. I love to rant, as you know, and I my platform, you can say, being an eighty five year old boomer, um, boomer hottie. Um, I have just been busy with my age march as well, which is way over 200,000 views on YouTube now. So everybody join agemarch.org. But anyway, I'm happy to be here today and particularly with our guest, Linda. Uh, Hi, how are you? Hi, Linda. I'm so happy to meet you. I'm so happy to meet you. Reading your book, Linda, I'm going to get right to it. I'm going to get right to it because as an author too, and as an avid reader, you know, we all read lots of things. But when you, when I read, when I read Trusting the Currents by Linda Polio, I started to read and then I didn't read. I became immersed into the world and I'm just, I don't want to spend this time talking. I want to hear from you. And here's my big question, too. Okay. First of all, I am very, very much interested and a believer of voices, other voices from the other side that guide us. This really is true. I know I've had it happen, too. Okay. But... But your voice, what you call, what you call, and I wrote it down, the, when you unexpectedly, unexpectedly heard the mystical voice of Addie Mae, an African-American woman who lived in the 30s in the South during that rough, rough time, it still is for African Americans, but during that time, you heard the voice, and I want to know how. Talk to us how she changed your life, how the voice came to you, and literally wrote your book for you. Mm-hmm. Well, you and Addie wrote it together, and well, you know, Addie May wrote the book. I edited it. You <laughs> edited the book. Happened, you know, yeah. People, when the listeners hear this, they often will say, oh, no, that's not true. But it happened to Marianne Williams in Course of Miracles and many other people. We have to hear the listen to the voices. Talk to me about, talk to us about when and how this happened. You were a very successful uh, in the advertising agency. Mm-hmm. business in New York. Well, that's really, really sharp, cool, whole thing. <laughs> then boom, Addie Mae comes to you. Tell, tell us, Linda, how this happened. Well, it was sort of a long and winding journey. Um, I, like you said, I wasn't advertising. And then I um, took care of my father for a year. He had, um, I hadn't seen him in 17 years. He was an alcoholic and I sort of disconnected from him for a long time. But I got a phone call that um, he was dying. He had had a heart attack. So my uncle wanted to know whether we wanted to see him one last time. And my brother and I decided to go see him. He was unconscious. And we went in there and signed all the papers of do not resuscitate. And you know, I just thought it was gonna be a, 
a closing of sorts, but um, I had been doing energy work for years. So I started doing energy work on him and he came out of his coma and he got out of the hospital and I took care of him for the last year. And in that last year, we really resolved a lot of the you know traumas from the family experience of, of that. He really wanted to make up for um, his years of not being able to be a real father. And uh, we were able to understand and get to meet him as the man he was and not really need him as the father that we needed him to be at the time. Um, after he passed, I was with him. I was um, leaving the hospice and I go to get in my car and there was a bench and on the bench was an old book. It was an old paperback of a book called The Call of the Canyon. And I didn't know anything about it. I just picked it up. I threw it in my back seat and I cried all the way back from Pennsylvania to uh, New York um, where that's where he was living. And three days later, I got up and heard a voice say, go to Sedona. And for anyone who has had that experience, Sedona does call people who are meant to be here. So I just got on a plane three weeks later. I had nowhere to stay. I didn't know why I was going. And I threw the book into my backpack before I left. And I ended up getting a flat tire when I picked up my car, ended up in a little motel overnight. And I read the book. And called The Call of the Canyon is by Zane Gray. It was written in the 19, really like, I think in the 1920s. And it's about a woman from New York who gets this, you know, call to go to um, what turns out to be Sedona, actually West Fork, um, to actually, it was different. His, it was to follow her fiance who had been in World War I and had shell shock. And he had gone West to get healed and didn't come back. So she went out looking for him. So her search was different than my search, but it was still about these two women from um, New York that go to Sedona. So I get to Sedona. And as soon as I get there, I know that I'm home. I've never felt the sense of being a play, in a place of, um, of just, home before like that and I spent five months the first time had all kinds of mystical experiences and it sort of reawoken me to my childhood when I would communicate with insects I was always seeing things I was always kind of that odd child that was um being, you know sort of able to see things that other people didn't see and hear things that people didn't hear but I kind of pushed that aside as I got into my 20s so I could function in the real world and go to school and go into you know, corporate America. So um, by the time I came back from that experience, I was a different person. And I knew that I could no longer uh, just work for a company. I needed to do something that made a difference in the world. So I ended up getting involved in what was becoming the conscious business practices back then. That was the beginning of organics and solar energy and all these new companies had all these new ideas about how the world will be in the future um, in a way better way than we're living right now. So I got involved with that. I was involved um, doing conscious business practices, mostly for smaller companies that were getting started. And then I eventually became the chief consciousness officer, the world's first for a, a global marketing consultancy. And there I worked with companies, Fortune 100 companies that, um, in sort of introducing them to what I call the human technologies, which are wisdom, intuition, compassion, empathy, forgiveness, and gratitude. And I did that for about a year and a half. I worked for this company. I worked with the fort with you know with the CEOs and CMOs. So for me, it was really about educating corporate America on the way that we could be operating because this was about taking these these human technologies and bringing them into their employees and their consumers and their partnerships. And um, it was very interesting and I got a lot of attention for it. So I decided to start my own business. And so I, I quit my job and about four hours later, my mother fell and shattered her femur. <laughs> so all of my plans oh my went God. to hell. And I ended up going into nine years of 24 seven care. But in oh the process God. of that, I started hearing the voice of an old black Southern woman. I was working on a project and I was in my apartment at the time. And I just heard this voice say, it's not what happened to me that matters. And she was definitely Southern and she was definitely African. That's your first line of the book. It, it became I the first that, line of the book. And I so I just, that first got scared because even though I had been getting what I would consider high knowledge my whole life, um, I just get information and downloads um, 
you know, sometimes it's, it's for other people. If I'm speaking to someone, I'll just get information. Um, in business meetings, I would get information about what to do. She's with speaking directly to you. She was hmm? speaking directly to you. Yes, she was speaking directly yeah. to me, but I had been getting high knowledge, but never in a voice. It was just mm -hmm. knowledge. But this, mm -hmm. this was the first time that I heard a voice and it was nothing like my voice. So it was, so it was very distinct. I wasn't confused as to, am I imagining this is just me? It was definitely someone that was not like me. So I spent like, I don't know, 20 minutes um, listening to her. It was very kind of difficult in the beginning and just writing the first two or three paragraphs. She left. I put the paragraphs away. I didn't think anything of it. I figured it was just something weird that happened to me. And about three or four days later, she came back again and she picked up where she left off. So the first draft of the book took two years and it was basically stream of consciousness, meaning that um, I would have to wait for her to appear. I used to call it the indigo abyss because I would wait for her and it felt, I don't know, it looked indigo to me and it felt very cold when I was first getting into her. But then when she really connected into me, it was like we hit a warm current and then all the information and all her words would flow, but she would pick up where she left off. So I never knew where the story was going until I was writing it. And I never expected to write a book in the beginning. I just had this insane compulsion to write down her words. It really took me about a year of doing that before I realized I was writing a book. Let and me ask you, Linda, this is so interesting. So while she was talking to you, while you were hearing her voice, would you take a pen and a note? Oh, I had a computer. I was mostly working on the computer. On the computer. But she would sometimes start speaking when I wasn't. I'd be at work or I'd be on the road and I'd have to always carry a pen and pencil for me. Yes, yeah. Um, because a lot of what she said, um, which I found out later. Now, this is all looking back on it. At the time I was writing it, I had no idea what was happening or why it was sort of evolving the way it did. But what I found was that there's an energetic frequency embedded in the writing, which brings the reader into their heart. And a lot of that is dependent. It's almost like a sound therapy. Mm -hmm. um, it's very dependent on the cadence and the arrangement of the words. So I'd have to like, if I didn't stop and write down exactly the way she said something, I could remember what she said, but if I couldn't get the exact arrangement of words again, I would never be able to capture the feeling that she gave me while I was doing that. So that so, brings um, me to a question and I had to interrupt you. Yeah, because the writing is so lyrical and so beautiful all the way through. It's like a long sequence poem. Oh, thank you. So it's beautiful writing. So what I want to know for everyone out there as well, and as a writer, uh, did you then you then you added your in, you added words with what she was telling you? Because even your first line is what you said, it's not what happened to me that matters, it's what mama said mm -hmm. about. Uncle Joe and the old house and that little secret lying buried beneath the floorboards. So did she tell you that? Or did she you... told me that, that the, the story is all her. That's all amazing. her. That's and amazing. if she hadn't told me the story, I don't, I never would have, I mean, if you had told me before I was writing this book that I was gonna write a book, I would mm -hmm. tell you you were crazy. I had no ambitions to write a book. I had from what I could tell, no abilities. I mean, I was always a good business writer. I could write, because I was in business development, mm -hmm. I could always write a letter that would get attention, but these were letters. <laughs> this is very poetic. You know, your, your metaphors about the moon and the water and the sunlight and the leaves as you're telling the story, it, it, it almost has a slow chant to it. Like you, you just have to keep following it. And that's, that's what she wants. She wants you to keep following it. So it, it took me like it, the two years that I, that I channeled her um, about a year into writing the book in New York. Um, she told me to go back to Sedona. 
So I got on a plane and I went back here and I spent nine months and all the nature you read about in the book yes. were all experiences that I had here in Sedona. Um, and nature plays a big role in the book. It's, yes. it's a real character in the book. And so I spent the last, I spent the next nine months in Sedona doing the same thing channeling. Mm -hmm. And then um, I, when I wrote the last words, I didn't know I was writing the last words until I wrote the last words. And when I wrote the last words, I knew the book was done and I burst out crying. <laughs> it was very- you know, Linda, Linda and, and um, Barbara, I have a question because <clears throat> Linda, you were on Avoid the Maze and we talked yeah. about some of this. And two days after you were on, I was talking to another author mm -hmm. and um, I'm reading his book now. And he talked about that he didn't write it. The yes. characters wrote it. Mm -hmm. And I see it here thinking about everything that I've ever known about writing. And yes, I know we imagine the characters in our head somehow, mm -hmm. and we put it out on paper, but it was almost like what you were saying. Okay. He didn't call it channeling, but he said, no, the characters came to me. You know, I didn't tell the character right. to say this. Yeah. He said this. And that's when I went back and re-listened to the podcast. And I thought, wow, this is interesting because you're not just some woman out there who's trying to sell a book saying that this woman channeled you. This is something that many people have the ability I think people, to connect with. I think more people can have these experiences if they're open for them. I mean, I when she came to me, I was sort of, I mean, I had been open to it because I had been doing spiritual work and work in consciousness for years. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like it was an unusual um thing to happen but it didn't had never happened to me before um and it never happened since i've never heard a voice since then either it, she was very singular in my life but don't you think linda and karen that we all our lives our lives what we call fate is really just listening and and going on different paths sometimes getting off the path of dreams and then, you, you know, you can say, well, the fate changed, but we do have other voices in us and they come in our dreams. Do you mm -hmm. think, and I believe that our dreams and everyone dreams, those are free. You don't have to go to school to have a dream. And those dreams, those people we see in the dreams in images we see in the dreams, mm -hmm. I think are often clues to our inner life and, and what we're feeling and maybe what we should be doing. Don't you think that? I think, you know, what I've learned from my many years on this path of spirituality and consciousness is I don't know anything. <laughs> that, well, that, that is it because- The more I have learned, us. the less I know. And, yes. and all I can really, I always look at consciousness as sort of like this big landscape. And for me, in a, in a landscape of consciousness, because it's so complex consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, I basically like anything's possible. We live in a landscape of possibility. For yeah. me, it doesn't become so and it can become a belief system, I can believe something. Uh, and and I didn't say I channeled this book for a long time. I mm -hmm. never told people that. Um, mm -hmm. But what I did when the first book first came out, I mean, the, when the first draft was done, I couldn't even put my name on it. I said, by Addie Mae Aubrey is told to Linda Palio. It wasn't until I spent eight years editing the book because I really think I learned how to write by editing the book. I didn't write oh, yes. the draft. Yeah. I wrote, I learned how to write while I was editing it. And she, I think helped me. But once I finished the first, the first draft, she left I never heard her voice again. It was all sort of me working on it. So I stumbled through because I didn't know what I was doing. But um, I didn't tell anyone it was channeled for a long time because I felt sort of odd about it. I mean, I think people are becoming more open to those concepts now. So I'm more comfortable with it. And that's what it felt like. But what it truly was, I don't know. And I think everyone has the capability. I mean, I could have heard that voice and said, no, I have to work, go away and just said, this is crazy and gone back to my, my project I was working on and she would have gone off to someone else or it would have, that, that, that potential, that possibility would have left. Um, but I decided to accept 
that possibility. So that set me in a whole other direction. And, and she's really been the most influential person in my life. But, um, you know, what that really was, I don't know. But I, I kept, you know, I, I kept a very strong relationship to her my whole life. Um, so so I, this is so important, the relationship, not only to our inner lives, but to listen and hear. And, how, and we all have visits from the other side. This mm -hmm. morning on the news, they were showing the new virtual world through the meta. What do they call it? The meta world that's going to be. Right. Right. And the universe. Know, the universe. And this is all coming now where we can have voices and relationships. What you say is our, the subconscious to me holds our lives and our truths and it holds everything. That's true. And yes. Yeah. And once you get that out, then you can, you can transmit to other people and to people like Addie May, mm -hmm. you know, things, th I have always believed, okay, as an author, tell me too, I want to know, because I know what the journey is to get a book out there, to get an agent, to get a publisher. Not easy. When I was publishing books, there, we didn't have self-publishers, and it was like, oh, it was tough. It's still tough. It's still tough, the whole process. So I want to know, so when you finished this book, this book that won an award, I'm looking at the gold stamp. This is incredible. It's won 13 awards so far. Oh, my God. And the winner of the 2014 Nautilus Gold Award for fiction. Do you know how hard that is, listeners, for readers? I mean, I well, they told me they they told me when I won that award. It's a funny story that I won't go into, but um when they told me when I won the award that I was the only indie author who had ever won the award. The, the, the woman who won the award, the author that won the award before me was Barbara Kingsolver for Flight Behavior. I, oh, I know. Yes, I know. Uh, yeah, and the year after me was T. Geronimo Johnson. Mm -hmm. um, I forget the name of his book now. So, um, yeah, it was very unusual for me to win that award. Amazing. And that was the first one that it won. So I want to know the journey of this book. So this was published when? This was published actually in late 2013. 13. Yeah. And, and then it's won 13 awards. And I want to know, has Addie May been back? Are Addie you, May has, has not another, been back. She has no, not Addie May, I mean, all, I mean, I don't know. I, I can't tell because I don't hear her voice, mm -hmm. but um, she's with me as kind of a, I can't give up on this book because I really believe in her and I believe in, in what she's trying to bring to me. You know, I used to ask her all the time, like, why did you choose me? I'm this white, middle-aged white woman from New York. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, she's writing about a young Southern black girl. Um, you can't get more insane than that. And I worried about what people would think about it. But, you know, she always told me that's exactly <laughs> why, to show what two women who share the same compassionate spirit can accomplish when they, Come together. Oh, there it I is. Love that. Right there. The essence. So the that was the whole thing is to bring book. it was to bring, you know, different cultures and you know, multi-generations and multicultures and you know, that, that I think you know, was both of our dreams. Yeah. Especially today. Now today, this is so important because yeah. there's such a division between um races. There really is. Uh, this, this is amazing. So what are your plans now? I want to know. Are you going to write another book? Or um, I will write another. I have a couple books that I started, mm -hmm. but um, it's been sort of a, you know, kind of windy road. You know, I, I got this book out and I indie published this and dealt with everything while I was caring for my mother 24-7. Yeah. So that was a really big uh, deal. And, you know, the, the, the awards really helped me because I, this book came out and three days later, my mother shattered her femur. So I really did no promotion of the book for a couple of years, except to mm -hmm. enter the awards because I just, I, I was immersed in caregiving. So that kind of kept me going because I had no idea if the book was any good or not. I couldn't get anyone to read it that I knew because they didn't look at me as a writer. So um, it took me, you know, 
this book has been a slow burn. I mean, it's been out for several years now, but it's really beginning to find. It's just a beginning to find it. Because yeah. people are ready. You know, it's really a great book for people that are going through struggle in their lives and that really need to kind of do some inner work. Because as you well know, as Addie Mae tells you her story, she brings you into your own story. Absolutely. So it's and a really big deal. so important. I'm going to stop you right there because... Mm -hmm. Our own stories, our own inner lives, we have to go inside much more and listen, go into your subconscious. And you know, another thing, I'm really sickened by this attitude towards writing and books. It's like, I, I'm trying to explain, I do believe and I know that anyone at any age really can write and publish a book. Now, mm -hmm. the marketing of a book, the promotion of a book, isn't it sad that that exists? You know, we hear the words platform and this and that, mm -hmm. publicist and this and that. So many books, including mine and others, <laughs> they get out there, but they kind of fall because unless there's some real promotion, but you know where the promotion is, I believe, it's it's Addie Mae will give it promotion. Well, that's what it is. I mean, yeah. Yeah, she's she's always led me. I mean, the, the biggest problem with the book has been discoverability because mm -hmm. it does not fit into a typical genre. It's almost impossible to explain. Right, so right. you really have to experience it. So that's been that's been hard. But, you know, I've always said that um, or I mean, I always believe that you know, we live, you know, we look at this external universe and we have as big a universe inside of us. Mm -hmm. um, our inner universe is reflecting out to our external Absolutely. universe. Absolutely, it's a but mirror. We spend so much time looking at our external universe yeah. that no one, you know, very few people actually explore the, inter the internal universe. And I think, you know, creativity does that to a certain degree and studies in consciousness, but there's only one way to study your internal universe and that's to, to, to disconnect from the external world mm -hmm. and to go inside and Addie Mae was my guide into that and she mm -hmm. really I mean she helped expand my consciousness and the way that I looked at myself and at the world um, you know, dramatically she's been my biggest teacher in my life well, it's not an easy journey. It is not an easy journey to go into. No, you don't do this on purpose. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. It's, it's an arduous <laughs> journey. And you have to expect, I think, facing going into the subconscious pain um, and and feeling it and then moving on. And uh, But it's such an important journey. It's such an important journey. What? And I think that books and books tell the stories they document life the conscious and the unconscious they're documenting life and that's why books are so important in telling the stories but now, you know you know barbara th things have changed <clears throat> since when we were growing up obviously you know because there wasn't really self publishing <clears throat> because there is independent publishing now more people are writing their memoirs, oh, yeah. you know, they're writing yeah. their fiction. And I think people should continue to. Mm -hmm. But when, when I first learned of Linda, I looked at, you know, I read her bio numerous times before I invited her to be on my show. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of my show, I said, wow, this is a show. This is a guest for Barbara. Why? For a number of different reasons, both your, both authors, but, Linda became an author at a time of her life when most of us would say, well, I'm not going to do anything new now. You know, <laughs> I, you know, I've been in business. I, this is what I do, but the reality of it is life has changed. And because life has changed, we can do these things whenever, but because there's so many books out there, mm -hmm. it's so hard to read them all. I it's have to tell you, I have 103 downloads on my computer and i read i read a page of each you know yeah. every once in a while because i don't have the time to sit down and read them all right. mm -hmm. but as i start reading them you know i just get mes mesmerized it's like well this isn't a new york big seller but you know what 
I like this better. And it might be, you never know. Exactly. And the the bestsellers aren't always particularly. So so to your listeners, we all can do what we want to do. Oh, absolutely. In fact, I wasn't even going to bring in the age, but now I'm thinking because to me, I never know how old anyone is, nor do I think it matters. The numbers really don't interest me. But Linda, I don't know how old you were when you started this process, but I... I was in my, in my, uh, how old was I? I was in my, my start of the process. I was in my mid fifties. Oh my God, really? How old are you now? I'm 67. Oh my God, bless you. (laughs) To me, you're ageless. People are ageless, all this fuss about the number. And, but I'm asking because I think it's important. When I, I teach work, writing workshops to uh, women and men 50 to 100, mm-hmm. and every single one of them says when they come into class, oh, I think I'm too old to do this, but do you think it's possible now? And I have my journals in this. And, please don't even say it. Let's start writing the first day. And I see miracles. Uh, You know, a man 96 just published his book through one of my classes. The point is, anyone at any age can write a book, tell your story, go inside yourself and dig out the stories are there. You just Uh, say yes. You you just say yes to the opportunity. Because we all get opportunities that, that come to us but some, you know, they, they, we're so, we're so channeled into our daily life and stuck in the scaffolding of our existence and, yeah. and what, and what we we're supposed to be. to be. Yes. Right. That, that when we get an idea or we get an opportunity or we get a glimpse of a voice in some way, shape or form, maybe it's not quite as strong, but it's something that calls to you. This is why it's important to have some um, to do some work on inner work because yeah. then you can recognize that it's it's the subtle energies of the other side trying to get your attention, and then you or, can say yes. And more people have to say yes instead. I'm too busy. Mm-hmm. You know, I could have said I'm too busy, and she would have just gone on to someone else. And I think creativity is very much like that. That you know, we're, we're little antennas. Yes. For example, memories. Mm-hmm. We all, they talk about memories. Luckily, when we get older, if we're lucky enough to get older, right. we have memories and we have tons of them. And I discovered during the pandemic, I went back to those memories. Yes, it was painful and startling because I had to take accountability. But those memories can be your books as well and your stories as well. You know, whether it's a diary or a journal or going inside the memory, there's so much out there that will go on into other universes. Well, you know, it's also about expectations. When I, when I first started channeling her and, and writing and writing the book, I had no expectations. I just needed to write. Mm-hmm. I didn't think, oh, I'm going to write a book. Oh, it's, it's going to be this, that. I mean, I just had to write. So I had no expectations. And then and then when I finished the first draft, I went, okay, I'm done with this covenant with Addie Mae. I'm going back to my normal life. And I, I literally put the book away for a year. I, I had no interest in publishing it. I just felt like I had done what I had, um, what she had asked me to do. And so I put the book away for a year and went back to work, you know, and went, okay. Cause I, after channeling for two years, believe me, you're a little wacky. <laughs> so I wanted to ground myself again and I needed to make money again. I needed to go back to what I would consider my, you know, quote unquote, normal life. Yeah. And about a year later, she came back to me, not as a voice, but as an impulse and said, you need to start editing this book because it came out, the first draft came out in very heavy Southern black dialect. I literally wrote the way that I heard her. Yeah, I wrote the way I heard her. There were no chapters. It was literally just one long diatribe. It's three hundred. So, it's almost three hundred pages. Yeah, it was and long, but it was. I didn't have it in chapters. I'm it's a very it long up. story. Everyone oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm holding it up. This is a treasure. It's and a very long story about how this book. This book has touched many people um it has had i mean in the process of deciding what to do with it like it um somebody put it into chapters for me um uh it's 
I won't go into the whole it's story. A lot of work. It's, it's a like lot a of work. Hour I know. Explanation, but it's it's very long, and um, I think when you begin to do something, um, you should not go into it with expectations. Mm -hmm. You should just follow your your own voice. I think that's important. And your own heart. You said that you the heart and not following the expectations. Right. That's the key to creativity, yeah. to love, to yeah. living to everything, that message, Linda, let's hold that message. It was that, it's, it's, it's very important. And, you know, I only became immersed in like the quote unquote marketing of the book because it just kept winning all these awards and I kept going, well, I should need, it needs to get to more people because, and, and the reviews I have on Amazon are insane how this book has affected people. And the funny thing was, I really thought this was going to be a book for women because it's strong women characters. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of all men. black characters, mm -hmm. but they're amazing, strong women. And um, but almost half my reviews on Amazon are from men. No, I saw that. It's, <laughs> so it's it really touches people that are a certain stage of stage in their life. Um, and it's very visual. Um, I've always, you know, I've had a lot of talk about um, it becoming a movie because it's such a visual story. And my dream, my dream was always about having this sort of multi-generational, multicultural bunch of women bringing this book out because it's such a strong woman's story. Well, Linda, it might very well become a movie. You don't know what's going to No, I don't, I don't know. And as I said, I, I don't have expect, I have dreams, mm -hmm. but I don't have expectations because every time, you know, I've been working with this book a long time now and she's, she's really taught me how to work with her and when I tried to bring her somewhere if I tried to lead her somewhere it would fall flat I have to stand behind her and wait for wait for the timing to be yes. right yes well I just think you have enormous gifts oh, thank to, you to not only for the book but to share this experience in your heart with all the other hearts out there and all the women who are out there who are thinking I want to do this. Well, you know, if they if they believe in themselves long enough and look inner, you don't know what's going to happen. Anything can happen, right? Well, and it may not be writing. I mean, it may, it may not be writing. It, it could be. It could be. Maybe something else with, that you're you're called to, or it could just be leaving what you're doing. Something you know, it's, that will make a mark into your life on the universe on mm -hmm. the planet in, yep. into the universe and trust me all of you out there because at, at 85 you know something I absolutely think that people are living way past 100 now but it doesn't matter if you only live to 30 or 90 or whatever get in touch with yourself and stop listening to all the the anti-age ads and all this stuff and well that's i mean you really have to get to know yourself and, I mean, I, yes you have to get to know yourself so can everyone buy your book linda on amazon yeah it, it's okay it's on amazon it's also on itunes and some of the oh, other it's on all the so yeah, all it's, the it's on all the media. platforms I mean, mostly it's on amazon because it's amazon <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So Trusting Currents by Linda Polio. Get this book and have a wonderful, wonderful day and love yourself. And right? Don't Absolutely. Get off, don't get off on the age stuff and oh, the woes and this and that and the other things. Sickening. <laughs> well, and, I think today is was wonderful having you return to the rant, Barbara, oh, thank and you. especially with Linda, because yes. it just opens up a whole new conversation. Oh, yes. Yeah, she's changed and, my life. Absolutely. Oh, really, really, well, yeah. Addie May will change. Addie May changed your life. Addie yes. May changed my life. Addie May changes a lot of lives. Well, you're generous in telling the story, and it's wonderful meeting you. Always wonderful being with Karen on the rant. And I can't wait for the next time, Karen. Absolutely. Have a great day, everybody. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye now. Bye.